Hello, and welcome to episode 7 of series 4 of the Engaging Internal Comms podcast. This is the show for employee engagers and internal communicators who like to keep up to date with all that is new in our profession. My name's Craig Smith from The Big Picture People. Well, we're coming up to our 100th episode. We're only a few away now. This is episode number 95 in total, so five more to go. We're planning that episode to go out on the 6th of June. Not sure what we're going to do for it yet, but uh, it'll be 100 up, which uh, is a is a significant achievement for, for us and, and most podcasts uh, count 100 as being a, a, key, a, key, a key milestone. So we're looking forward to that, looking to, forward to putting together a special episode for you uh, for then. Um, just coming up in the next couple of episodes, in uh, the episode that's going out in uh, two weeks' time on the 11th of April, we have an interview with Tracy Mailer and Tim Vanderhey. They've just written a book called Swipe, which is all about why we don't finish what we start. I'm sure that will resonate with many, many of you, and it certainly does with me, in terms of unfinished projects that we have both in our personal and professional lives and Tracy Mailer and Tim are going to be and Tim Vanderhey are going to be telling us all about the science behind that in the book that they've written and it's not just a self-help book it's very very pertinent to the work that we're doing in our organizations when it comes to engagement and communication initiatives which is why we we got the, them on the show so I think you'll find that really really interesting uh, and then uh, two weeks after that on the 25th of April got an inter- interview with Stefan Widener. Uh, Stefan's based in Canada and he's going to be telling us all about the importance of creating psychological safety in a messy world. Psychological safety is something we're probably all a little bit more familiar with, although there are multiple definitions of it that I come across. Uh, equally, all equally valid, but um, Stefan's going to be giving his his definition of psychological safety and also, more importantly, how we can help to create a sense of psychological safety in our organisations when all around us is fairly tumultuous at the moment, which I'm sure, again, will resonate with many of you. Um, coming up, uh, also, we have some of our free webinars, which I know uh, our listeners uh, regularly attend. Um, we, If you want to find out more about them, we've got a couple of different webinars. I'm going to be adding some new webinars webinars for that series so I'll keep you informed on that Um, all about communication all about engagement all about how you can uh, use some very powerful techniques in order to improve those within your organization so I'll let you in you I'll keep you in the loop on the new ones but if you want to interested in going to any of the uh, existing ones that we run every month uh, go to our website thebigpicturepeople.co.uk go to the um menu bar and go to the events and you'll find the two regular webinars that we run there listed and you can sign up for them totally free of charge and uh, we'd love to have you along um and i think that's probably about everything for this episode i've got a few more announcements to make but i'll save those until the next episode and uh, we'll get straight into this episode's interview <laughs> A topic we've covered on the show before and I wanted to cover again was frontline workers and how we communicate with them. And what we're talking about here are employees who do not usually interact with technology in the way that we think they will. And sometimes this this uh, population is referred to as deskless workers. Globally, there are 2.7 billion deskless workers and they span a number of sectors, including supply chains, manufacturing, health and education. So what we're going to explore in today's interview is what sort of channels do they use and that they don't use. The fact that technology is often one of the things that is a barrier and 20 to 40 percent of the workforce that we've been talking about there don't actually use emails or apps that are one of the main communication channels that we tend to use in our organizations for our employee communications. The impact of this we're going to explore as well, including turnover and retention, the costs of lost productivity, and also the challenges of having employees who leave the business, uh, and also low adoption numbers of the technologies that we are using to communicate with them as well can be another indicator of the problems that we have. Um, Finally, we're going to look at what are some of the success criteria of any communications that we should be using with this population that we're calling work front line or deskless and the importance in particular of two-way comms 
the fact that they need to understand how they can have a career with the company, a long term career that, that they can grow and learn and, and and have new opportunities within the company. And also the disproportionate importance of health and safety, physical safety to this workforce or this population as well is something that we need to include in our channels. So that's what we're going to be exploring with today in, in today's interview with a real expert in this area, someone who's extremely passionate about it and also has a, a really interesting backstory as to what's led them to doing what they're doing. So I think you'll find this interview, uh, as, as all of our interviews are, but this interview in particular, if you have a, a workforce where you have deskless workers or frontline employees uh, of, of particular interest. So here we go. My guest today is Muriel Clawson Kloss, PhD. Muriel is a frontline expert and was named a Forbes 2022 Future of Work 50. She is CEO of co- and co-founder of Ant Hill, and Muriel has authored a number of scientific publications, including The Future of Work, for Cambridge Handbook, on the changing nature of work. Through her work with the Interaction Council, she has advised a number of lead world leaders on their workforce policies. Muriel currently serves as an advisory board member for the Humans for AI and as a speaker with an emerging technology think tank called the Singularity University. This focuses on the future of work with organizations including the World Bank and the Milken Institute. So Muriel, how are you? Doing great. Thank you so much for having me on the show. It's an absolute pleasure. And for our listeners who are usually, I've, I, oh, last time I checked, we had, uh, I think we had a, a listener in every continent apart from Antarctica. Wow. Um, where are you based? Where, whereabouts in the world are you, Muriel? Yes, I'm in Chicago in the United States. Fantastic. Wonderful city. I mean, one of my favorite cities in the States. So uh, yeah, I gave uh, a, a kind of a, a synopsis there of some of the work that you're on. I hope I did it some justice there. But um, just for the listeners, just tell us a little bit about what you're, what you're doing at the minute, what Ant Hill does, and what your kind of uh, career role, what careers take, how your career has taken you to where you are, and what sort of things uh, you're involved with now. So there's lots of things to talk about there. But uh, over to you, Muriel. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so I have had a long time passion for the frontline workforce, and we'll get into who those folks are. But I grew up in a community where there wasn't really an expectation that you go to university. There, um, most of the jobs that folks had were working with their hands, or in the field, or on the floor, or on the highways. All of these kind of good old uh, jobs that keep our world moving. And so that's what I knew. That's that's the work that I loved, and the the people from my community. Um, ended up, though, on a winding road in academia, as you heard, um, as a researcher. <laughs> and in that process, I realized when I was in the context where we were studying the workforce that this um, population of workers who are actually uh, in total 2.7 billion people globally, 80% of the global workforce, um, really aren't actually included in our research. And digging into it more, um, we really saw that the biggest challenge was communication. It was mm-hmm. really tough as researchers, but also as employers and policymakers um, to connect with in a, in a scalable way, this population. So I became obsessed with how do we communicate with the front line um, that's had many twists and turns um, on the policy side, on the academic side. And now um, as an entrepreneur at Antil, um, we started Antil with the simple mission of actually opening up equitable access for the frontline workforce to all the resources um, and information that their employer actually wants to share with them anyway. So that's what I get to work on today, but still very passionate about this from many perspectives and love helping folks understand how they can communicate more effectively with this workforce. Brilliant. That's a fantastic backstory. I love. I love the fact that you you kind of uh, and I I relate to that as well because I I mean I worked uh, for for a, for a food company in in a food factory for a number of years and uh, and also before that worked in you know, you know jobs that involve people working out in the field you know driving around in trucks and and uh, and 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 four by fours all day and and never really having anywhere other than that cab that was their workplace and and communicating them i mean i'm going back a fair few years now pre pre internet and uh, and and uh, an email even but but even then it, it was notoriously difficult and i think that that as you you've alluded to that is a um, a group that um, we haven't fully kept up with, I think, with with, with our technological advances now for people who are desk based. So, really interesting. What about Ant Hill? Tell tell us a little bit about what Ant Hill does and and how it kind of um, satisfies that some of those challenges that we just talked about. 
Yeah. So to, to set up what Antil is, I'll expand on that, that uh, communication gap you're just referring to. So you'd think, right, with all the technological advances that we'd be doing a better job than that time period you're referring to working in that food plant. But, but we're really not. Uh, still, when you look at kind of how many kind of communication channels and solutions touch this population, it's very limited. And mm. I, I think the main reason is because when we're software developers or desk workers, we kind of assume the tools that work for us might work for everyone. Mm. And I think sometimes miss like really how materially different the experience with technology is for this population. Um, if you look at economies like the United States and the UK, for example, um, which have large knowledge worker population, still uh, 60% of the workforce is technically deskless is, or frontline, mm. meaning that they don't sit at a computer um, or a desk to do their job throughout the day. Mm. Um, and of those folks, even in the US and the UK, 20% do not have a smartphone. Mm. So if our solution is email um, or an app or anything that actually requires some kind of data connection on a laptop or a smartphone, um, you are for sure leaving out a good portion of your workforce. Mm. And so we were always interested in, um, well, how do we make sure we're actually including everyone? And how do, more so than that, like how do we really meet people where they are? Um, we always designed from the beginning for the most kind of marginalized worker in an organization. We thought the person has the toughest time actually connecting with their employer. And if we can solve for them, we can solve for everyone. So mm. what Intel ended up being um, was first a research project for us where we just thought, what it would be a way that we can actually talk to these folks for research. And we found that text messaging was really the most inclusive route. Okay. Okay. Um, but text messaging is a mess. <laughs> yeah. It, uh, it's something that can have all kinds of problems. So we were um, basically developing a machine, machine learning approach to make texting a useful tool to communicate with folks at scale. So what Ann Hill is today is um, not just text that messaging. It's a multi-channel way, but employees get to choose kind of Okay. The channel, the device they receive things on, um, but it's essentially a way to actually access and use all the resources in the company, receive all the information in the company um, in one's preferred language uh, today, over 110 languages um, and in like a reading level that is accessible to them. So it's it's just very simple communication pathways that are adaptable to just the practical needs of different types of workers. So, okay. for example picker packer in a warehouse only has a flip phone, no other access to technology. They could be wondering when they're getting paid text in on the platform in their preferred language. Maybe it's uh, Spanish. And then our system would find that answer for them and automatically route that back to them on their flip phone, just okay. like if they were using the internet at a company. Okay. Okay. Oh, that's, that, that, that's fantastic. That's really interesting. I was wondering how, how, how you overcome that because I, I've, I've picked that up as well. So I guess we're kind of jumping at, uh, I, 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 it's my fault. I, I've jumped, jumped ahead by asking <laughs> you about what Anne Hill does and we've started to answer some of the things we were going to talk about, but let's just rewind a little bit then. So I think we've kind of already done this, but let, let's just define what we mean by, you know, we've kind of, I've kind of put it in, uh, in speech marks in, in the, in the kind of um, notes that we're looking at now just to keep us on track as frontline employees which is a very very broad term and kind of implies some sort of hierarchical thing going on but I guess we're talking about anyone who doesn't conventionally work at a desk or a workstation or, or as you say have access to a smartphone is that is that right or are we are we is it is that too narrow yeah so broadly if we're talking about the frontline workforce and another term folks are using more and more is the deskless workforce. Yeah. Those are kind of synonyms today. But mm -hmm. we're talking about the frontline workforce. Um, we're talking about, again, those 2.7 billion people that don't sit at a desk or computer mm -hmm. to do their job. So these are folks that are not living in software to kind of work day in and day out. Um, there's eight industries that make up the frontline workforce. There's some that are probably very obvious to anyone listening, like supply chain, manufacturing, um, but it also touches on industries like healthcare and education as well. Mm -hmm. um, what we find, though, is across these eight industries, there's a lot of similarities in the work experience and how folks interact with technology or really a lack of interaction with technology. If you're not actually sitting at a computer to do your job all day, um, that's a really kind of different relationship with software um, if you basically are like building something on a factory floor. Right. So, when we think about um, a lot of components there, though, there's there's kind of a subset of this population that are probably 
hourly workers in some countries or on some kind of different labor agreement. Maybe they are a member of an organized labor group. Um, but often the folks that we're talking about in the frontliner deskless workforce are those workers that unfortunately today don't have as much support um, or as positive of a work experience as mm. their kind of desk or knowledge worker peers. So okay. it's often when it's being talked about, um, it's a group of folks that feel a little bit left behind. And is that 2.7 billion? Is that a, U- a US number? Is that global? Just, just so you get an idea of, of how many, I guess it, yeah, it's got to be global, global, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Glo- yeah it's got to be, yeah. There are 2.7 billion people in the US. So yeah, yeah. No, no. Yeah, I, I, yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, uh, wow. 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 Yeah. So for framing on kind of how many people this is, so globally, it's 80% of the workforce. So if we're going right. to, you know, pluck a person at random, the modal worker globally, um, that is going to be a frontliner deskless worker. That's mm. just like what work really still is on our planet. Yeah. But yeah. even in countries where people say, well, you know, in the US or the UK, that's not how people work. Well, no, it is. It's actually 60% it is. Yeah. of the workforce. Yeah. 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 And I guess, I guess in that, I mean, you kind of said, you know, the, the a few areas there, supply chain, manufacturing, health, education. I mean, would you include, I don't know, a surgeon in that? Cause they I guess they do have a desk and they go back to their, their more have a conventional office. But I mean, or, or highly educated, you know, kind of nurses, I guess you would class as deskless or, or, or are we talking about people who never have the opportunity to go and sort of sit at a workstation, which I guess those, those two that I've just given there probably do at some point. Yeah, I think as a communications professional, it's good to think about this group um, in the way they interact with technology when you're thinking through your channel strategies. So I think it is yeah. useful to think of the group holistically because even a surgeon, they do not interact with te- with software mm. the way like a strategic comms leader in a company does. No, so they're using no. technology differently than you are. Mm. But then within that group, I we at Antel really focus on that kind of more marginalized population, maybe that hourly worker, those yeah. folks that are probably working minimum wage jobs or um, have maybe more challenging components to the realities in their, in their work life. Yeah. yeah. Um, But all of this, all of these folks, including surgeons, including highly paid, highly educated um, workers, they, they use technology differently than you and I. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and I mean, we, I guess it, it, you know, we've kind of Im- covered this by implication, but, but why is this a challenging group to communicate with? I guess, as you've said, they, they tend not to have access to the technology. They may not use it the same way that we do. Is, is there anything else that, that adds to that, uh, that mix in terms of making them, a, 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 um, you know, kind of outside of our conventional thought processes or, or kind of, uh, s- strategies when it comes to communicating? Yeah. So we've had the privilege to get to do research with thousands and thousands of these workers in all of these different industries. And um, there's a few consistent themes that we see. So Mm -hmm. the first is just like, what channels do they actually access and use regularly? Um, There's the population that literally can't access something if it's on email, a software program that sits on a computer or an app, because they literally don't use technology ever in their lives that allows them to access. So that's going to be your most marginalized group. Mm. Estimates are that that population is 20 to 40% of the workforce that just literally will never engage. But then if you look at actual adoption numbers across this population, you see that um, most of the time, 80 to 90% of a frontline workforce in a company isn't adopting communication strategies um, that we're using today. And really the big three are the ones that seem to not land with this workforce. It's email. um, Mm. You just get Email is so effective, actually. It's funny, as much as we try to invent yeah. <laughs> new channels, email is still so effective with mm-hmm. knowledge workers. But it really just does not land with the frontline population. Um, additionally, like anything on a computer, if we build software that sits in a computer or sits in kind of the work experience, even nudging technology that's kind of in that work experience, doesn't land with this population. And apps increasingly just aren't getting downloaded. And if they are downloaded, they're not getting used. Yeah. Um, there's going to be exceptions to that. But on the whole, I think that as communications leaders, we have to get creative outside of these few strategies. Mm. Um, but the problem is actually bigger than this. It's also kind of how this population perceives communication from the company. Um, so what we hear a lot of times with um, 
frontline workers, especially from the more mi- marginalized group, is they say they have zero dialogue potential with mm. their employer. Mm. So they can receive announcements, maybe, not always. <laughs> they can mm. hear announcements. They can hear a safety briefing. They can be told they need to do something. But there's actually no kind of two-way dialogue that's possible for them. And this could be anything um, as simple as saying, hey, I have COVID. I can't come to work today. All the way to saying like, hey, I see this kind of safety issue on the product line and that I want to flag because I think this could actually cost the company a lot of money if we don't get ahead of it. Like anything from really adding value to the business to just kind of basic operational tasks day to day. Um, We actually found in our research that uh, 20% of turnover in the first 90 days is actually just a frontline worker who's unable to tell the employer that they won't be able to make it. And then they're marked as turnover before that communication can be rectified. Right. Okay. It's just these communication gaps that are like really silly and like should be solved. They're not good for companies. They're not good for the worker. Mm. Mm. Very interesting. I mean, I, I, I do, you, you said there that, um, you know, 20 to 40% of that, of that group don't to typically use the, the, you know, what I would think are the two, well, certainly the main channel, which is email. And I was funny enough, I was saying exactly the same thing yesterday to a, with a client I was working with about, you know, that we criticize and complain about email and yet we all use it, you know, when we yeah. last time you sent email, probably about last hot, you know, half an hour ago at late at the most. And then the other thing I find with apps and, and I guess, it's, uh, I guess, I, uh, uh, sort of paradoxically, it's it's not so much of an issue if the if people aren't using the apps. Is there's there's just such a proliferation of them, and there's so many. I, I find this sort of um, sort of channel confusion as to oh, we've got a channel for this and a channel for that, and and nothing really kind of seems to pull them all together. Is is even people who are kind of tech savvy and and outside of this sort of target group complain that you know, and I've had this with my own businesses, you know, we had Slack for one thing, we were using Trello for something else with WhatsApp. But, and it was just, it was just, I can't remember what that conversation was taking place. Was it an email? Was it, you know, and, and I think that's a, that's a challenge outside of maybe what we're going to be talk about today, but certainly um, kind of yeah. linked, I guess, in a certain way. Yeah. Well, and, and one note there is, I think, with apps, we're asking somebody to kind of go to a destination to communicate with us. And I think we know as comms leaders, like it's really tough to compete for attention yeah. with everything else that's yeah. in, our folks in our workforce. And so I think we're making our job harder if we're asking people to kind of learn a new tool or go to a new place. Uh, what I see work best, whether that's with a technology like Anhill or with a very low tech solution, is to really meet people where they are. Absolutely. Um, obviously, I think Anhill is a great scalable way to do it. There's other great scalable ways to do it. But with your frontline workforce, like instead of having uh, a new safety notice that's shared in the in an app or as a message from the CEO in the app, are you are there things physically in the environment on site for these folks to feel like a part of the discussion? Like, yeah, uh, one of the main internal comms tools that I think is underused with the front line is a suggestion box in the break room. Like, Mm. do they have a way to actually say something to you? And I think that um, the number one thing we hear from folks that work in this workforce from a comms perspective is they just say like, I'm obviously not respected because I literally have no voice in this company. And Mm. I think as comms leaders, we sometimes have all this pressure to get messaging out there, out there, out there. I think we have to think about that two-way street. I agree. And really meeting people where they are with avenues for that two-way yeah, street. Yeah. And and dare I say, having managers who can talk to you and listen to you as well is a really key part of that as well. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> by the way, frontline managers, they barely even have time right now to do what they're hired for and what they're great at, which yeah. is they actually supporting the workforce because they are treading water with retention, operational tasks that aren't scalable. Um, so that's a really big part of the comms equation too, is like, let's make all of these kind of redundant tasks like rescheduling and shift filling and where is my W-2 or if you're in the United States for tax season or yeah. when am I getting paid? Let's make all of that automated so that the people who are supposed to really be engaging with this workforce have the time and breath to do it. That's another thing we work to to accomplish with folks. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Okay. So we've kind of talked about, um, you know, the scale of the issue we've talked about, you know, you've, you've really, I think put some fantastically, 
powerful numbers there in terms of the, the proportion of people who are affected. And you've kind of alluded to this to a certain extent, but, but what but what are some of the kind of, you know, results of, of, of this deficiency that we, we have in our, our, our world and our businesses and our organizations when it comes to this kind of forgotten um, audience or not forgotten audience, but just, just isolated and, and feeling, they feel forgotten and they feel ignored, uh, even if that isn't the intent. What, what are some of the kind of metrics on this in terms of the connection maybe to disengagement? You mentioned there a little bit about retention. I mean, are there any KPIs or measures on this that we, we can kind of use to sort of kind of build the business case if, if we haven't already? Yeah, absolutely. So there's the things that we see happening today that are immediate costs that your your CFO can't ignore, right? There's the there is the turnover issue which there is a ton of data to support mm. that communications are a big driver of turnover with the frontline workforce, mostly just a lack of communication or just no uh, mode to get information. We actually found in a in another um, kind of study that we did that uh, ghosting, first day ghosting, employees that just don't show up after being hired in the first day. Okay. Uh, one of the primary drivers is that they just never got the instructions on where to go or what to do or how to get paperwork or any of those things. And there's like a lot of kind of, I think, shame in that. So wow. uh, one piece is just like, this costs a lot of money. We we all know it's it's super expensive to hire. It's super expensive to have high turnover. So there's real costs to like this lack of communication with this population. Um, we also see a lot of like productivity loss, especially with these managers. If you're dealing with these kind of routine communications tasks on a one-to-one basis all day, mm. if you can't reach folks through your scalable tools, so you're calling one by one um, to fill shifts, things like that, that's like time lost in the organization that gets mm. really expensive as well. There's also compliance issues. Obviously, laws are different in different countries, but most countries protect this workforce to a greater degree um, with some of the laws and policies around communication. So if you have managers kind of doing things on personal devices or kind of off the books, um, that can get companies into very expensive trouble. Yeah. Uh, where we see though, like I think kind of the more hidden costs are on the just like lost opportunity side. Like for example, if your HR team has decided it's strategically critical to adopt certain benefits or programs, maybe there's some kind of um, tuition reimbursement program or something like that, that they really think is strategically important for the workforce. Um, I always tell people, look at your adoption numbers for the front line. How many of your like frontline workers are actually accessing and using those resources? And if it's low, like you're not actually capturing all the value of that probably big, expensive strategic investment you've already made as a company. So are we getting the most of our investments? Then there's this other piece, which is are you an employer of choice? Like, especially if we're employers, you know, in, in you know, kind of more local, small communities, uh, people talk, people talk about what it's like to work at Factory X, you know, they're, they, they have these conversations. And what do they say about mm. working in your organization? Do they say that it's a good place to work? And we see consistently in the data that you can only compete on pay and benefits for so long. Um, there's these intangibles go a really long way with the frontline workforce. And that's what stops someone from walking across the street for an extra 25 cents an hour. Mm -hmm. um, so we we kind of encourage employers to think about that. The, the, the pressure there is on for employers. And I think it's, it's great that it is because I think it causes us to build better workplaces. But um, this frontline workforce globally has options. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at just numbers in the United States right now, the latest um, Bureau of Labor Statistics data shows that there's about 0.6 uh, frontline workers for every frontline job an employer would like to fill. Yeah. So the math literally doesn't work. And then people say, well, oh, that was because of the pandemic and this will all normalize. Well, actually, no, um, this trend existed long before the pandemic. And if you look at projections of kind of who is going to retire and who's going to be entering the workforce, there is pretty much like a one to 10 ratio of frontline worker to jobs for the frontline worker projected over the next seven years. And that's even factoring in two major recessionary events. Mm. Um, this is a workforce that like the demand is is growing for. Um, and then the other argument is, well, what about automation and technology is going to replace all these jobs? We're actually not seeing that happen, mm. um, not even close. And if we look at where automation is having more of an impact it's actually on, we've all experienced kind of chat GPT recently. It's actually some of these more like knowledge worker support tasks that are moving forward. Yeah. The engineering required for physical labor, the costs um, 
kind of trade-off just isn't there right now for most of these frontline jobs. And and we and I really, as someone working in the future of work in the policy space, I really don't think we're going to see these jobs go anywhere for a long time. No, no. So it's it's a big kind of messy, immediate challenge that companies have to think about because there's only so many people you can hire and turn over. At some point, um, you need people that see the value of building a career at your company, or you literally will not be able to staff your operation. I mean, the numbers show there will be winners and losers in the war for talent at the, at the front line. Yeah, I, I agree. I was working with a, a retail client of mine a few weeks ago, and we we had this conversation. And you know, one of the big challenges they have is um, is attracting and retaining the right people because it, it, a retail is is it's a difficult sector to recruit into. People don't see it as a you know a kind of long term career choice. Uh, even, you know, w- with a company like this that, that, that really look after their people and develop them and give them lots of opportunities to, you know, kind of learn and sell different things, not just kind of one, you know, one product, but um, even that's difficult. And, you know, and, and I think it's a good question that you mentioned there because we used to use that when the food company I referenced earlier, we, I used to run a lot of employee focus groups and we'd always kind of try and find out you know what's what what are people you know, the things they wouldn't tell their managers always or their 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 own leaders we we used to go and ask them and one of the questions we used to ask is if a friend asks you what's it like to work there well, you know tell us what you would say to them and it was such a telling response that you would get as to right. whether they were a bit advocates for that place or whether they saw it as you know it's okay the money's okay but it's rubbish you know manager never tells you what's going on or it's you know there's it always seems chaotic nobody you know it's kind of headless chickens and and and, and what they would say would be really kind of uh candid and but also yeah. told you a lot, a lot about you know uh, <laughs> things that you could never get from an employee survey or if you did you would have to kind of really do a lot of digging behind it so uh, yeah yeah no and I think here's the here's the good news especially I think for folks listening is mm. I really see like the comms leader in a company as kind of the hero in this story mm. we, we meet with CEOs a lot that are talking about like we've invested and, and it's globally, it's billions of dollars in programs to, to support this workforce. They've invested in new benefits. They've invested in tuition reimbursement. They've invested in kind of employee listening programs, engagement surveys, engagement technologies. They've invested in so many things to try to make this work experience better. But then if you look at where does it break down, and we whiteboard this with lots of companies, um, you just see like none of it matters. Mm. If we don't get the communication strategy mm. right, yeah. if the workforce doesn't know about it and they can't be engaged with it in a continual way over time, those that we literally wasted a hundred percent of those dollars with this workforce. Mm. Um, and so I think that like the most critical person in this recipe is that comms leader. And I think comms strategic comms leaders are so um well suited to think about channels and the effectiveness of channels and really look at the data and see like, if we're actually, if we're not just looking at our top line numbers of engagement, what if we really slice that and look at, well, what percentage of our frontline actually even saw the engagement survey we tried to put out, for example? Mm-hmm. Like, I think you'll see that you have like this real opportunity to make change. I think you're like a critically important to the strategy um, that your CEO and your CFO care about of retaining this, this workforce. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very good. Very well said. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I've got a couple of questions that I'm going to wrap together to to, to kind of bring things to a to a to a close, Muriel, and and I kind of think they're they're similar. I know you've you've talked about Ant Hill, and and I also you know you've been objective enough to talk about you know our technology or different types of technology. So there's a couple of things just to kind of close on, which is. Um, you know, how, how, how can I, what, what are some of those specific needs? And again, I think we've probably covered these already, but it might be worth just sort of bullet pointing them and highlighting, you know, what, what are this, 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 the specific needs of this deskless, this deskless frontline community that we're talking about, but also whether it's your approach or, or a different approach, what, what sort of techniques should I be looking for that specifically address some of those needs? And you may have, you may have, as I say, you may have covered some of these already earlier on in the conversation, but I think it'd be worth maybe just putting a highlight, a pen through them again, just to sort of make sure that we, we kind of cover them. So what are the specific needs and, and what are some of the ways that we can address those needs that kind of maybe, you know, the conventional approaches that we use for desk-based people don't necessarily do? Yeah. So if you um, decide like we really want to make a change in this area and and with our strategy and what we're doing, I think there's a few key questions you have to ask yourself about anything you're going to build internally in terms of a program or buy from a vendor. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think the first is like, is this actually two-way? 
That's just the number one thing we see move the needle with the front line is can they ask questions? Can they use something almost like a help center um, for those kind of more operational matters or all the way up to can they actually make suggestions and have a voice in your company? Yeah. I would really look for two-way solutions. We just see that move the needle so much with trust in an employer um, turnover intention, all of those things. It's one of the best leading indicators that you're making a positive change with this workforce is if they would tell you, we believe we have a two-way. And it's not you thinking you have a two-way solution. It's them thinking, yeah, yeah I believe this is a two-way communication I have with my employer. And by the way, there's technology-free ways to do this. You can give space for your managers to actually open up the floor um, for conversations like you described at the at the food plant. Like yeah. there's, you don't have to buy something to do this. You might decide you need to, but two-way, that's the critical component. Mm -hmm. um, beyond that, the other things that we hear from this population is like that they want to know that there's an ability to kind of build a future at the company, um, which I think that sometimes like we think like, oh, people need these like really fancy, you know, like goat yoga retreats or something that's going to be like, <laughs> you know, super fancy benefits. A lot of times what we hear from this population is they're like, I just want to know that like if I ever have the opportunity to get my forklift driver certification, like I'd, I'd love to do that. Like I'd love to to get that extra opportunity on this floor and move from being a picker packer to being a forklift operator. Mm -hmm. Like is there a way for you to actually collect that data and have those conversations with your workforce? Um, like what a bummer if you have a great dedicated employee that leaves because they think they can't be a forklift operator at your plant and they go across the street to be a forklift operator and you're trying to hire for a forklift yeah. operator. Anyway. <laughs> so I think like that's another really critical piece is making sure there's like a dialogue around careers with this population. I think we miss that, how important that conversation really is to to all workers, not just knowledge workers. Um, another p big piece, and this is true um, for different reasons in different countries. In the U.S., I think we can Im all imagine why it's so critical um, with some of the recent headlines, but safety, workplace safety. Mm -hmm. um, there is just a totally different relationship that this population has with things like weather, for example. Mm -hmm. um, during the pandemic, when all of the knowledge workers, desk workers got to work from home, the vast majority of people in the world never worked from home. Work mm. did not change at all for them. They were still going to work every day. And so I think really thinking from a communication strategy perspective, like, do we have a good way to help people understand how we're keeping them safe in these different situations? And there's been a lot of extreme weather this, this winter. And we see a lot of, um, um, of the employees we talk to in our different research projects that we do say like, I had to drive through a blizzard to get to my shift to find out that the factory was closed for winter weather mm. when I like just would have loved just having some way outside of that app notification that I never saw to just know I didn't need to do that. Like there's also then physical safety on site. Do they have a way to share if there's safety concerns? Companies should care about that, right? Mm. It gets really expensive if we don't get that right. So realizing that like physical safety is a extra kind of consideration that matters a lot more to this population than it does to desk workers. Mm. Um, and then I think that one of the big things that we can overlook, um, especially with the more marginalized group in this population is language. Um, we have had so many employers tell us, oh yeah, all of our employees speak English, that's requirement of the job. And then we roll out our product with that population and we find that 40% of that workforce chooses to use a language other than English. Mm. Just because somebody is comfortable working as a picker packer in English doesn't mean that that's the language they're going to be most comfortable in rolling in benefits in, um, or maybe even having those conversations with their partner at home who maybe doesn't speak English at all and wants mm. the information in a different language, or um, you know, talking about a sensitive topic, reporting a safety incident. There, that might not be something that they feel comfortable doing in English. And we want the information, we want the dialogue. So opening up those different path pathways for language inclusion, I think, is really critical. Mm. Uh, that's for I could go on all day, but I'll leave no, it there no, now. I, and and that that's that's amazing. And and it's funny, we're well, not funny, but I, I mean, we should. I, I won't mention the the company that I I uh, I was referring to earlier that I used to work for. The, the certainly 
the first three of those that you mentioned were something that was really drilled into us when we when we worked there. One is two way comms that was like seen as the kind of oxygen. Um, it was basically you know one of the principles of the company was we want a direct relationship with our employers. We don't want to kind of have to you know a third party to come in and sort of interrupt that flow. So that two way communication is kind of you know if you're a manager you need to be good at that uh, else you need to come find find a job somewhere else um the whole you know kind of career conversations was something that all managers were trained to do whether you manage you know kind of frontline or or kind of you know you know kind of more more kind of technical uh, more more educated people you you had to be good at having those conversations about what do you want to do where are you going how do, can you develop you know because it was re- relentless in that respect and and also safety was the first thing anybody talked about when Whenever you went to a kind of plan or a meeting, it was like, okay, tell me about the safety numbers. How, who, what was the last injury? You know, who was it? What happened? And so everybody kind of knew that that was something you you we would get. You know, we would talk about. So it's really really interesting that that, that kind of DNA of that company yeah. sort of is embedded in. And and language was was a was a you know we it was a multicultural workforce. Um, but 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 the, certainly the first three was a really big big thing. So it's For really sure. reassuring to hear those things again. Yeah. Well, and I'll just cap it with one short one, which yeah. is I really encourage comms leaders to think about the most marginalized worker in your organization. Mm. I really think if you solve for them, you've solved for you've built something Brilliant. simple and simple that everyone can use. Yeah. And so I, I really think putting on that hat with any solution that you're considering is really important. It's great that you worked at a company that was thinking about those things. Mm. Um, you know, we've we've worked with the largest employers on the planet and you'd be shocked how many companies oh, like, yeah. still have none of that. Yeah. Uh, and and if you're listening and you're like, my company has none of that, it's no. it's probably not your fault. I no, think no. We haven't had, yeah. yeah, we haven't had really tools to, to help us do that, especially in a scalable way. Sometimes this is easiest for the small uh, 50 person shop, you know, where you can still kind of have those one-to-one relationships, but it gets really hard as you grow. Um, and as you're in these larger organizations. Yeah, I agree. I, I was spoiled and I went out and I went as a kid now, obviously I've been a consultant and working, you know, my own business for 15 years, wherever I go to companies, I'm kind of still kind of surprised that, oh my goodness, that not everybody still does that. You know, no, not every thing that every company does the things that we did 15 sort of 16 years ago when I was there anyway, but yeah, but look, anyway, look, Muriel, I'm going to, I'm going to bring things to a close. I mean, what, one of the things that's really come across to me and I'm sure our listeners are thinking the same thing. So I'll just echo that I, in, in, in lieu of before they've actually listened to this, uh, will be, you, you know, a, your passion is kind of really, really, cl- really clear. And also, you know, you, you clearly, know what you're talking about because you 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 know you've rattled off there some amazing um numbers some amazing data you, you kind of the, the 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 call to action the the sense of urgency for people to do something about this and also you know kind of recognizing some of the common denominators about what we need to be doing in our organizations for for this this uh, this sort of these marginalized groups is is really really important and and so you know I'd like to thank you on behalf of our listeners for what what I've I've really enjoyed the conversation um that we've had before I let you go though um I'm going to ask you: Are there any anything, any ways that I, I'm going to put your LinkedIn profile in? Because I guess that I'm 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 guessing, but I'm I'm pretty sure there'll be certainly a few people who are going to want to kind of at least you know reach out to you and say hi, and then find out a little bit more about you and what you do. But have you any other links that uh, you want me to stick into the show notes for any resources that you have at Ant Hill that we can kind of point our listeners to, or anything else that you've got that you'd like me to highlight? Absolutely. So if you go to anthill.co, anthill.co, we do Mm -hmm. share resources to kind of support you in your journey with this workforce, whether you're looking at technology or not. Um, Next month, we have our annual State of the Frontline Workforce report coming out where we look at all the latest data, all the latest learnings on what this population is saying that they want and need from their employers. So definitely recommend you check that out. But routinely, we're releasing new resources to help you be successful um, and it's not uh, all, you know, technology solutions. I think technology is only a tool to help people do what they do well. Um, so it's a it's a lot to help kind of an internal comms leader with their strategy as they're thinking through this workforce. So w- wonderful. please enjoy that. And then, um, yeah, we have events sometimes, but you can kind of follow along with all of that information at antil.co. 
brilliant. Right, you said that that's next week, so we're the you're, you we we people are going to be listening to this towards the end of an uh, end of March. So that that means that definitely will be in, in out there. So that we're we're recording this beginning of Feb. So yeah, that that uh, document that you your your uh, your 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 report there will be available so people want to go and have a look at that on the website. So uh, fantastic. Well, look again. Thank you so much, Muriel. I've I've really enjoyed that. I was one of the one of the interviews. I've got a lot of interviews lined up, and and uh, I look forward to them all. But this was a topic, as I as I've kind of alluded to in my uh, kind of um, you know kind of how it resonated with me that I was really looking forward to talking about because I think it is one of those areas that um, just just we you, we just forget about because it's not it's not that kind of uh, glamorous area that you know everybody loves to do the kind of big you know kind of town halls and the big projects like the involving conferences with all of our senior leaders but these the the people we've been talking about today are the real you know the work ho- work work not the workhorse but the kind of the the driving uh, the drivers of most of the kind of uh, revenue in our businesses and we and we forget them at, at, at our peril so it's it's fantastic that we've had some time to talk about them yeah, absolutely. Well said. And thank you for the opportunity to have this discussion. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you, Muriel. Take care. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Engaging Internal Comms podcast. If you've got any ideas for episodes you'd like us to cover in future, you can email us at info at thebigpicturepeople.co.uk or you can use the feedback form at engagingic.com. If you're not already subscribed to the show via your podcast platform, please do so. And if you could leave a review for us, that would be absolutely fantastic. We have links to other episodes at engagingic.com. All of our previous episodes are available there. And if you're interested in our visual communication services, our big pictures, our learning maps, our explainer videos, and also our live graphic recording, please get in touch with us again at info at thebigpicturepeople.co.uk. Thank you.